All right, everyone. Uh, first of all, again, thank you for coming back, listening to the DL. Um, this is one of those episodes where I was first like, eh, I don't know, I'll learn something about these guys. But as I dug into it, I was like, man, this is actually some really important stuff. And this is what I love about the podcast is I get to sit down for 20, 30, 40 minutes. Um, and I talk to these people before we air, after we air. But just being able to have conversations with industry experts like this is just really, really surreal in, in my mind. Um, so I hope, I actually, I don't know if you listen to this, you're going to come away with a little bit of information and know something that you never knew before. Uh, so API, the American Petroleum Institute, they, they are the ones setting the standards out there for engine oils, def fluid. Uh, they're the ones helping the cause to try to lower the cost of energy for all the fuel that we're using out there. It's a huge organization. Uh, super honored that they took some time out to to work with us over here on, on the DL. So without that, I will let you watch the episode. And again, like, comment, share, all that stuff helps us. Enjoy the show. Welcome to another episode of the DL. I am your host, Tyler Robertson, the CEO and founder of Diesel Laptops. This is the podcast show where we talk about everything going on in the commercial truck, the off-highway equipment, the diesel-powered industry. And today we're gonna get we're gonna get into the weeds here uh, because I was a service manager before, and I used to see all these acronyms on oils and lubricants. Um, I never quite knew what they meant. You know, you kind of know a little bit enough to be dangerous. Uh, we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about some def. So uh, it's gonna be a really interesting conversation. I already learned a lot just doing my pre-research. So I'm really excited to bring an expert on here. So today we have Jeff with us from the American Petroleum Institute, or API as we like to call it. So Jeff, welcome, welcome to the DL, man. Pleasure to have you here. Hey, I'm I'm glad to be here, and I, I just love the name of your podcast. Well, well chosen. Well, well, thank you. We'll give our original person here uh, props for that. So it, it's worked out well for us. Um, so I, I, you know, when I first got connected with you, I was like, who the heck is the API? And um, you're you're a pretty pretty good sized organization. So can we just explain to everyone who who is API and and, and what do you guys do? Yeah, well, we, we, we do an awful lot, as you alluded to. Um, first of all, first and foremost, you know, API represents uh, oil and natural gas industries. Uh, we have over 600 members. Uh, we support, you know, and, and basically our industry supports 11 million jobs. Uh, you know, so we do everything from standards development. We've, we've developed, you know, we've, we've been around over 100 years. We started uh, as an organization developing standards shortly after after World War One, when everybody realized that uh, everybody did things differently. Standardization became a, a big topic in the in the field of in in, in the oil field. So uh, that's that's where we cut our teeth. Um, you know, here now, 102 some years later, uh, you know, we've been uh, not only continuing with that standards development. Uh, but we've also, you know, as you know, developed engine oil performance standards, working closely with OEMs and industry to develop uh, each and every category that uh, that you guys are familiar with in the shops uh, and uh, also uh, developing a licensing and certification program that's now uh, over over 30 years old uh, to ensure that high quality lubricants are out there and available to consumers. So, uh, you know, I, I've been with the program for about 12 years. I started uh, working with our aftermarket audit program. This is the program that uh, basically supports the licensing program where we're out in the aftermarket buying bottles, filling up jugs, uh, you know, in quick lubes and, and uh, you know, and diesel shops. Uh, and, and testing those oils uh, to ensure that they meet the, the, the claims that they carry. So now I'm managing the program. So we've, we've come a long way in the last 12 years and uh, we, we're, gonna, we're going a long way, especially with uh, you know, currently developing the next set of diesel engine oils. So you're in charge, uh, I believe, of the engine oil licensing and certification program. Like, like what, what exactly is that and, and why is it important? Yeah, so it's a voluntary program that we run where oil marketers and manufacturers alike can um, seek to become licensed by API to use the API registered trademarks. And, and for those who don't know, uh, that's the API donut or the service symbol, which is usually found on the back of, uh, of the bottles. If you walk down any aisle in a, 
local parts store. Um, you'll see it on, on the back. Uh, but also we um, have the API certification mark Starburst, which represents oils that meet the latest, uh, the latest gasoline engine oil categories. Um, and, uh, and of course, we, we uh, ultimately license diesel engine oils as well. So these marketers that sign up to join will disclose to us very specific information about the formulations used to fill their products. Uh, you know, if you think of a large global company, for instance, they, they, uh, they have different sources of supply in different parts of the world. We require them to basically license each and every one of those formulations. So then we, uh, then we can test it in the aftermarket and compare our results with, uh, you know, with the results that they've uh, reported to us during licensing and, and just ensure that these products meet the performance specifications that are desperately required by, uh, you know, the OEMs. Uh, you know, you can flip to the oil manual in pretty much any one of our vehicles and see uh, in the oil section, uh, you know, one of the API marks. So, yeah. So, is there is there a problem in the industry with like people? I guess right. There's different oils made. The sand, the oil come from the sands of Canada is different from the oils in the well of Texas. I would guess right, and they have to meet a certain standard for whatever application. Um, is this a thing just to instill confidence in everyone? Like, Hey, this is a good quality product. Is that, is that the main goal that you're trying no, to get across? No. And in fact, you know, you, you really, your question comes down to what's in a lubricant. A lubricant is, is, uh, uh, essentially a, a base stock that's refined from crude, regardless of where the source comes. And it, it can even come from, uh, recycled, uh, engine oils for that matter. Um, and, and then it's necessary for the additive companies to provide an additive package that will give it the performance that you need. Now that's not to be confused with the aftermarket additives. This is literally uh, the other component, chemical components that go in to the base stock to give it multi-viscosity properties, just to name one thing. Um, so really the, 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 the need for the program, if you look at where we've uh, been, uh, especially over the last 25 years with uh, EPA regulations coming down uh, down the pike, not only for the on-highway, but the off-highway diesels, uh, as, as well as gasoline. Um, you know, the OEMs have, have needed to find ways to meet these emissions targets, and, and certainly engine oil uh, it has been uh, in, intrinsic to that process, and, and these oils should today be considered really a technology, just like a sensor on your, it's, it's that important. And, uh, and, and that's the big driver for ensuring that, uh, that the quality of these engine oils uh, is, is good out there among the marketplace. So we've, we've got over 800 companies licensed individually. I think we've licensed uh, over 24,000 products. If you go check our engine oil license directory, uh, this this is this is uh, beyond just the need to uh, you know ensure quality. It 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 really is a, a a check and balance system as well. Yeah. So I mean, you mentioned the emissions thing, and I was thinking earlier before this podcast, I'm like you know, I remember back in the day, like you know, like a Cummins N14. So going back to the 90s, those engines you had to change the oil every 15,000 miles. That's what the OEM recommended. And then I was like, man, let me go look at the maintenance intervals on today's engine. So I looked up like the Cummins X15, right? So they're big, popular 15 liter. Um, and if and in a light duty application, that thing can go 75,000 miles without needing oil change based on the OEM mm -hmm. recommendation. So something's changed, right? Like what what's changed? Is, is, is technology and the oils been getting that much better? Is the engine manufacturer machining better? Like what's what's changed to allow these longer intervals and have better quality? It's all of the above, really. The engine technology has come a long way. You've got uh, you've got very specific and important needs. You know, the the this. Uh, I'm not an engine develop uh, engine builder or anything, but uh, or designer for that matter. But tolerances within the engine are being decreased, and that has a higher uh, that has a puts a higher uh, onus on on the lubricants themselves, and so. The oil marketers with the additive companies and OEMs alike have successively developed higher performing engine oils, not only to maintain backwards compatibility for those older models that might specify an older category like CI4 or CJ4, uh, but to ensure that uh, it will meet the needs of the coming engine park. And uh, as I alluded to before, we're in the process 
uh, we call it PC12, proposed category 12 uh, of developing the next diesel engine oil category, working with all these stakeholders uh, to, to meet the needs. Uh, you know, they're asking for us to license this, uh, first license these types of oils in 2027 to sort of correspond with the, the next set of on-highway GHG regulations. And uh, again, lubricants is a super important part of the package uh, with higher operating temperatures and different cycle times. You know, these lubricants have had to evolve to be able to handle these, uh, these very uh, unique and, and, and myriad uh, situations in the duty cycle. Yeah. So you mentioned a bunch of acronyms there, right? So just for the audience, he mentions GHG, greenhouse gas. Uh, my assumption is, is this new PC12 category of engine oil is to meet the new, the 2027 standards for the emissions coming off vehicles and everything. So how, how important of a role has oil played into the entire emission thing that's been happening since 2004? Because first we had EGR, then we had DPF, then we had SCR and, you know, all the, all these things have kept happening. Um, and I know people really don't talk about the oil a lot, but from my understanding, the oil industry had to change to make all this stuff happen. Yeah, it, it's been integral in every step of the way. The one thing I can promise you, uh, is the, the trend that has been here for a number of uh, standardization cycles, but uh, will be here uh, through the near future, is the trends toward using low viscosity or lower viscosity oils. So where some of your... Uh, uh, older guys in the shop might uh, might might be used to sticking 15W40, or you know maybe they thought 10W30 was a big stretch. Well, believe it or not, you know being closely related to what they're considering in the next category, the trend is going down into the 5W30s and beyond for these newer technology engines that are going to be expected to meet these greenhouse gas. Uh, uh, emissions uh, targets. And uh, you can't do it without improving the oil. The lower viscosity you have, the lower, you know, oil while being a lubricant uh, is, is also something that pushes back against the engine as well. So with low, lower viscosities, you're getting less pushback. Uh, and the technology of the ingredients in those oils has risen so that even though you know, engines are still getting small, tolerances are getting tighter. You're even at those very low viscosity oils are still able to move around all parts of the engine compartment that it needs to to effectively lubricate the application. So Yeah. And you mentioned one of the other things you mentioned was additives, right? So I worked at an OEM dealer and we were like additives, stay away. OEM doesn't recommend it. Do you guys get into the testing of the additives or in those conversations or like what's what's your stance on the additive situation? Because to me, a lot of them, I'm like, is it smoke and mirrors? Is it snake oil? What I, You know, you just don't know. Right. There's not a lot of confidence behind that stuff, at least for me. Yeah, I, I would say that we take the same tack that you used to back in the day. We certainly do not recommend aftermarket additives into your typical oil treatment, uh, you know, and I'm not trying to badmouth that industry or not, but, uh, you know, it. it in our recommendation, when we get asked this question, you know, you have to think about the downstream impacts that uh, adding something aftermarket uh, could potentially have on specific uh, aspects of a, of a formulation that's, that's designed to meet modern performance levels. And unless those uh, additives are, are heavily tested to ensure that they're not uh, tweaking any of the properties of the engine oils that, uh, that could be detrimental to the system, uh, you know, we just we just take the stance that it's it's not recommended uh, very simply also because the OEMs still do that as well. So, yeah, yeah. No, we, we were always shocked when people buy a brand new hundred and fifty two thousand dollar truck and they're dumping in something to it that we're like, what, what are you guys doing here? Right. That's an expensive thing you're, you're playing with. So uh, interesting to hear that. And I know you have another website, the mom website, the uh, motor oil matters dot org website. What what is that website? Yeah, well, Motor Oil Matters is a program that, that API has that essentially licenses uh, installers, so quick lubes, uh, other you know, mom, mom and pop shops uh, that meet uh, chain of certain chain of custody requirements, which we have published for free on our website uh, in API 1525A. But uh, it just raises the level of accountability at all parts down the distribution chain from the time that the oil leaves the manufacturer through its distribution levels down to the consumer of ensuring that you are, uh, you know, accurately recording the order and providing exactly what that uh, order entails, right down to the viscosity grade, right down to the 
performance level, whether that's API performance or a European performance or even an OEM standard, all of these things and brand name for that matter, need to be reported down the chain of custody so that me as a customer that could potentially roll into a quick lube can have a piece of paper at the end that says exactly what was installed in my engine instead of just four quarts of oil. So one of the stats I saw right on the front page of that website was one out of five uh, bulk oil API tests fails um, for, for these. Like what, what's going on out there? Why are they failing? Is it poor quality, poor storage, poor chain of, you know, who owns that thing? Like what, what's happening? Yeah, there's, there's, there's a couple things going on there. First of all, that, uh, you know, that data is, uh, you know, some years old. Uh, so we still see those trends uh, that, that bulk engine oils. Uh, can have a, a can be expected to fail more often, and there are different levels of failure. Um, but for us, if it's not meeting the specification and doesn't meet that license fingerprint that they put on file with us, we consider that a failure. So uh, I'll give you a, a perfect example of, of of what can be going on if if somebody at a lube uh, at a lube center uh, is changing over uh, their oil tanks and they're not properly cleaning it out or or, or, or having their uh, supplier, uh, you know, drain out the 10W30 and, and install 5W30, you get, you end up with commingling of different products that can affect the properties of, of the engine oil, especially on my side, the analytical side, when I'm talking about that license fingerprint, obviously these uh, various metals that we measure uh, don't check out when we actually test the products. So that's just one example. Um, I've, I've seen and heard it all, you know, from things with, uh, you know, suppliers, uh, maybe not sucking back in the tank, uh, what's left in the hose and, and, and ending up putting a, a glut of 15W40 into something that's a lighter vis. Uh, all of this is just imperative to support what you support. And that is education around why it's important to, to, to consider, uh, you know, managing your own shops, to avoid those types of, of, of scenarios and, and, and also do so by, you know, making sure that your suppliers are following the right procedures. And, and so I, I really respect what Diesel Laptops is, is embarking on here. You know, you kind of piqued my interest when you talk, you said cleaning tanks. And I was just thinking back to my service manager days, like, I don't think we ever cleaned our tanks. Um, I'm guessing now, but you said that there's probably some recommended practice we should have yeah. been doing. Uh, so for the audience listening here, if there's like a, uh, a diesel repair shop or whoever, is, is there a recommendation how often they should have those things looked at, inspected, tested, cleaned, any of that? Well, it, it's more for, it's geared more for the, uh, the distributors and above, but there is useful information in one of our standards, which is available for free on our, our website. It's called API 20, uh, 1525, not the one with the A at the end. And this one really des, uh, describes bulk recommended practices for bulk engine oil handling, transportation, and storage. So there's useful information there uh, for anybody involved in that in that supply chain, um, for sure. Well, the other thing that I know is kind of under your purview over there at API is DEF fluid, diesel exhaust fluid. Um, so I, I know you're the API Institute. How did you guys get into DEF? Like, how does that fall under the, the mission of, of API? Well, this is going to sound like we're tooting our own horn, but the engine oil licensing program has been around for many years, and is and, you know it's 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 quite relied upon. I mean, even uh, you know the EPA certifies engines based on what type of lubricants they're going to be specifying and things of that nature. That all plays into uh, uh, you know the annual certification process for everybody's uh, fleet of, 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 of engine park, shall we say. Uh, but the so the EPA is uh, well aware of API. In fact, they were right down the street from us when we were at the old office location here in DC. Uh, so that whenever uh, SCR really took off in the uh, you know 2009 2010 time frame, and and once Navistar actually started using SCR as well, uh, you know the the big concern was can industry put together the network. Uh, the infrastructure required to ensure that DEF not only meets the specifications, but, you know, is available to all these on-highway guys that are going to be forced to use it. And uh, they, they, they modeled, they, they asked us to, um, to uh, model a, a licensing program for diesel exhaust fluid 
based on that model. And uh, you know, it, and while it's mainly a North American uh, licensing program, because some of the other parts of the world have their own, uh, you know, specs and licensing bodies, uh, it's it's still you know uh, has over a hundred licensees. Uh, with with over 200 and some odd products licensed. So uh, whereas the engine oil program is global, we're, this is mainly focused in North America and a few scattered countries out, outbound. But uh, this is uh, that's why we got into it. And, uh, you know, the need for it is continuously important as more and more demand for SCR grows, as everybody is trying to reduce their carbon footprints. Uh, it, 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 it only gets more important. So, yeah, I mean, you mentioned infrastructure there. I was, I was around then when SDR first came out, but unfortunately I was at an international dealer. We were, we were a little late to it, but it was just amazing how the industry actually came together for all that infrastructure. I don't think people realize how much effort had to go into, I mean, you guys were on the standard side and the testing side and all that, but it was just having the distribution network, the new tanks, the new products, all, all the things, it was a, a monumental task that the industry did. So it was, it was yeah. just amazing. And, and, and look, that even you, you, you can see glints of that in, in today's modern discussion about, you know, the conversion of the uh, gas, uh, you know, combustion engine over into EV platforms and others. Those same conversations were happening yeah. way back when and, and the industry really did come together and, and solve them in a uh, in a rapid amount of time. We issued our first license back in March of 2009. That was a full nine months before the on highway regulations kicked off. So it's uh yeah, we've come a long way, baby. Yeah, we, we definitely have. Um, so I know DEF, you know, it was a new thing and everyone was confused on what to do with it. Don't, you know, and people didn't know not to store it in sunlight or too hot or too cold or had shelf lives and all these things. Do you feel it's gotten better out there or do we, do you guys still run across that a lot with contaminated DEF or bad DEF fluid causing problems out there? You know, there, there, there are always a handful of, of, of products that we sample in the aftermarket that will, uh, you know, it works a little deep differently with DEF. We don't have licensed fingerprints. It's basically a, uh, a minimum standard spec uh, ISO 22241 for those who are interested in looking at it. Uh, and so these products are more fungible. In other words, if I make a DEF and you make a DEF, they both mix together should test out and be a DEF where you can't say the same thing for uh, viscosity grades of engine oils, for instance. Um, so, you know, uh, we, we don't see as many problems on that side. The industry has really taken upon itself to solve all the challenges of supply in a, in a crazy market. I don't, I don't think people are aware of it, but I mean, before all the geopolitical uh, shifts that have taken over the last few years, a lot of the urea supply that, that, that DEF is made from was coming from places like Russia and from China. And obviously, you know, these, these things are sh you know, rapidly shifting around and affecting uh, supply. So uh, the DEF industry has, has, has been pretty well top notch. And uh, again, we have a licensing program with an aftermarket audit uh, to ensure, uh, you know, to ensure the quality of those products. We have a API license uh, mark, uh, the DEF certification mark that, you know, maybe some of your listeners who have light duty diesels that use DEF should be encouraged to look for API licensed fluids uh, for use in their vehicles because it does come with that guarantee. Yeah, no, that was, that was the question I was going to ask you, right? It's, I mean, you want a good quality product. It's, it's there's places yeah. to save money and, and try to find inferior products. And then when you're dealing with engines and emission systems, like that is not the place, that's There's not the place right, to go save a couple right. nickels, right? Right. You've got onboard diagnostics that if the concentration is off or if you flat out just put water in there, you're not going anywhere. Uh, moreover, there are plenty of properties of that DEF. Uh, for instance, people think urea, they think fertilizer, and I can go in the backyard and mix up a tub of fertilizer with a tub of water. Uh, you need a special kind of automotive grade urea and you need pure water that's still deionized of certain type, not tap water, because various metals in, in tap water can, uh, you know, foul the catalyst uh, and cause problems to the SCR. So, you know, everybody wants to uh, really worries about, oh, you know, as long as the concentration's okay, my guys are going to be okay, uh, you know, getting across the desert without a, uh, you know, their their engine slowing down on them. It, it's it's way more than that. Savvy savvy fleets need to be using high quality DEF to prolong their uh, their equipment's lifetime. 
Yeah, we, we get it all the time, right? We got all these people with all these tools and always hooking up to things. And it's always, you know, I don't know why my truck derated. We're like, well, that's because your light was on for 10 hours and you ran out of death fluid. <laughs> like, it was, we only do so many warning lights and help you so much before you run into a problem. Uh, but it, it's been great learning about kind of behind the scenes, right? I think we see the labels, we see the names. We don't really understand uh, without diving into it, like what that means and the effort that it takes these companies to put these products in place and make sure they're safe, they're reliable. And it's, it's great work that, that API is doing out there. So we really appreciate it. Um, if people want to learn more about API, you mentioned a bunch of documents, and on, I'm assuming they're on the website. Where, where do people go if they just want to start getting into, uh, getting into more of this? Right. Well, API's main website is api.org. Um, so uh, that's where you can begin. But really, uh, you know, with reference to the engine oil licensing program, it's just easier to Google API engine oil. Or if you want to look at our directory and confirm that, uh, you know, a, a potential supplier of your engine oil products is actually licensed, you can Google API engine oil directory and uh, or DEF directory for that matter and and verify the, uh, the license status of those companies. And we're always, uh, you know, one of the one of the nice aspects of the uh, the specs that we provide on the engine oil side is we make those uh, free for all. Uh, this is an industry-wide effort to develop these performance standards, and it's important, uh, therefore, to make them broadly available to everybody. So API 1509 really describes the licensing program and houses all of the uh, nitty-gritty specifications around performance, too. Well, we'll make sure to put a link in the show notes, and I can tell the audience, when I went on the website, it literally is a tre treasure trove of information and knowledge on there on everything you ever need to know about these things. So, Again, thank you for coming on the show. We're going to wrap this one up. Uh, remember, everyone, it's not just diagnostics. It's diagnostics done right. And you got to make sure you have good, high-quality products that you're using. Save pennies somewhere else. Don't save them when it comes to critical componentry such as this. API is doing a great job out there helping make sure we're all safe and buying well-known products that are safe to use. So thank you much, guys. We'll catch you in the next episode. Like, comment, share, subscribe. It all helps us. See you next time.